Command form or, yeah, command form would be Natha, him or her. So eat, just eat as needs so. Mm -hmm. I want to make that correction before we go any further. Um, was, do you guys want to review this part? Um, yeah, then you This, these, so Jill has everything copied up over here, and these words, or these, um, are just like cheat sheets. And so these cheat sheets, um, the short vowels, the consonants, the words, um, long vowels, this little box right here is what's going to help you. And it's just for your information, for reading and writing. So it's this, um, this sheet right here will give you an understanding of how that long and short vowel sound. So if you can see, it says this is the double vowel system that we're using, and collectively all the language people decided that we're going to start using the double vowel system throughout so that it's easier to read. Because the old documents that we have through history they have many different ways of spelling and writing the language, mm -hmm. which has made it really confusing. Like I get calls all the time from people or emails from people all the time in this area specifically because a lot of the signs and the places are named after Lenape or Muncie language. And they're, whoever made the sign or named it, wrote it the way that they thought it sounded. And a lot of those people may have even had accents. So it actually, um, now a lot of those places are mispronounced. Um, so we're fixing a lot of those places. I mean that, and, but we have to figure out what it is first. You know, so it takes a lot of work. So doing this. We just came to the back from the here. And it's a lot of uh, native names on their streets, though. Yep. Their streets are named after. Yeah, so using the, vowel system, the double vowel system consistently throughout and learning how to read and write it will hopefully from here on out fix that problem. Because now we're going backwards and trying to fix what those words are. And it's kind of good for some of, for language people because it helps us to find words that no longer exist. Specifically, um, a lot of things that are missing in the language are names of plants and things that didn't follow us. Since the language, you know, like the people who left the community, this is what we found through history, but the people who left the area, the communities that left the area, were able to keep the language going um, because they didn't have to, we didn't have to hide our identity. Here, the language dissipated. But here is where the natural plants were to our people, right? So those plants that are to this land right here didn't follow in the language because we didn't use them. So when we go back and we trying to find out what the names are. We're actually taking the words apart, looking, trying to do the history on who named them, where they might have been influenced, you know, and then any, like um, one was the tall pine grove um, that I was asked to look into. So I've been working on it and there's multiple different ways of saying that. And so I'm just going to, I'm looking at the word and trying to depict it the best I can because the person who interpreted it might not even have interpreted it the way that it really was. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a lot of work. So using this double vowel system consistently throughout is going to help us be able to read the old documents from here on out to the next generation. So that's why it's important. And collectively, we all decided, all the language people decided this is the system we're using. Um, and the if you look at it, the Long vowels are double vowels, right? So this cheat sheet is what's going to help you. Do you want to kind of, we'll go through the sound so I can understand. So the double I, does anybody need this? Does everybody have it? We'll go through this just so you can get it. And so this is just for you to reveal. So it's just a review sheet and cheat sheet. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
be in the event. Of course. Could you please sign in for me? Thank you, my dear. Appreciate it. I'll bring you one of each. Okay. So you take this one. You have them? I got them. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, wait, wait. I need to. Thank you so much. Anisha. So if you look at this, we're just going to go through the long bows, the double I. The double I, the Lenape word is a keen soul, a keen soul, meaning he reads. So it is like the I in machine. That is how you read this chart. A keen soul. He reads. It's like the I in machine. So the double O, corn which means snow, like the old in post. The double A, mosh, like the A in father. The double E, cow, he came, like the A in at, but longer. So that was always hard to, and I, I guess, I used to use, because our neighbors say ah a lot as like a slang word, but in this area, you guys don't know our neighbors. <laughs> so um, I would say ah, like ah, yuck, <laughs> or you know, ah. It's not really a word that, or a sound that you hear in English. So that's one that you have to get used to. Short bow, I, Nila, I killed him. Oh, Nika, I killed him. I would have said that one wrong. See, and that's where it changes. So sometimes the I-H will make a long E sound. Um, but sometimes it don't. So the rules, that's again an example of the rules not applying. So I killed him like the it and sit. Nika, moch, moch. There's no federal. I always said a federal word. Moch. So that H-K-W blends together, moch. Like uh, blood, the um, sorry, I'm trying to read backwards. Like you and put. I suppose you all have it in front of you. I don't know when. <laughs> um, it's it's good for us to hear you say it. So uh, the a the short vowel pan. Um, oh, I'm reading it backwards. The Lenape word pan, like frying pan, is the o in sun. So that's another example. That's a borrowed word, <laughs> Ryan Van Pond. Match, which means now, like the E in met, match. Um, so, this isn't really a good example because, well, it is, but it isn't. So, Gook, which is mother, or, or my mother. Um, some people say Gook and some people say Gek. And I've never heard anybody's language or not. Um, they, it's both acceptable, but it's used here as gek. So it's like the E in Moses. So, yeah. I've heard uh, it said Kukana, uh, Kukana, Kukana, Ki, Mother Earth, but Mother, this is, this is a different word? Yeah. So, Kukana uh, is Kukuna. our mother. Kukana. Our mother. Um, we went through that, and I'll, I'll touch base on it again. Um, the different forms, because it will change whether you say mine, yours, theirs, ours, you, they, it, it changes. So, um, some of the, we've gone through these as we've been learning, so that ZH again is like the S in pleasure, and that guttural is really important. So I just had, I've been working with um, Montclair, Montclair State University with the language program, and they were asking me to say some words because they're working on helping me document things. And they couldn't get the guttural down. And I didn't realize it, but it did take me a long time to get that guttural down. For one, to get comfortable doing a sound that you don't 
sure. usually stay. And so at first, I guess, even when I was learning, my teacher didn't make a big deal out of it. He just was like, yeah, it's there, but it, you know, you're not staying yet. <laughs> he understood. But that federal, um, it takes practice, right? So that's that sound. So this is really just for you to be able to read it. So like when you're going back and read it. And we talked about the phonetic spelling before. Um, there's always, especially if the words, the sounds don't, aren't in English, then it's hard to go back and read see them right. how you wrote it phonetically. So that, that's kind of, and we can keep going, reviewing that until you guys are comfortable with that review sheet, but I want to go back to this. Um, so, if, I don't, I'm sorry, what's your name? Thanks for joining us. So this is kind of what we've been going through is just like table talk. So when you say I'm eating, I is me. So you say ni nimitsi. Now when you're saying nimitsi, you can actually take the ni out because you're saying I twice. So you're, con you're conjugating that word. Um, ki is you. So ki knitsi. And again, you can take the ki out you because it's already built into the word knitsi. And then naka, him or her. There's no differentiation between him or her. So naka, mitso. Um, you could take that naka out again and just say mitso and it's understood because it's built into the word. And it goes on. I mean, it, we're just starting with this. Mitso is to eat, that's command for. Um, so when you heard kukunaki and you were told it's Mother Earth, it is, it's our Mother Earth, kukunaki. So if I went deeper into it, and I don't, I've been kind of holding off because it, I want it to build, because then we can go into they, you, we, including um, the listener, excluding the listener, including, you know, excluding the person you're talking to, including the person you're talking to, that will change the form that you use. So one of the things we've talked about is you have to kind of wipe your slate clean from what you've learned in English because the rules don't apply in one thing. And some of us want English too, but it's just not, <laughs> not happening. <laughs> don't work that way. Um, so we can go back over these words and then I think what we're just gonna review. I don't wanna go into numbers. Um, and maybe at the end, if we have time, we'll touch base on them. And then we'll just keep roll counting repetition until we get it down. So, shokorapo. 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 So this is neat in general. That's why it's a butcher shop word. Atohewa. 
I'm going to throw a wrench in your thing. You had uh, chicken. What happens if you have fried chicken? Do you have... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll get back to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 This one was the worst. Mom, 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 Yeah. Uh, no, show me. No, 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 no,
Um, I can't remember your name. I can remember your sister's name, but you got a unique one. Ayane. 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 Ah, was it? There's 
We don't have it copied off. I don't think we don't have it copied I just off. Wrote what I but that was my fault. Example. This is my fault because um, this is mine. I had to check my email to get back to the. So there's no writing and reading. I'll do it after, right? But we're going to use our hands because it really does help, whether it seems like it don't. Good stuff. Good stuff. Please pull up a chair. Please pull up a chair. <laughs>
Did I do them wrong? I did. Now just to screw you guys up, this is seven. <laughs> and this is six. Gosh. Eight. I screwed up six and seven. No only. So two eyes. Yep. Nine. Mean butt. Ten. Gusta. <coughs> Nika. I don't know how to. How they. I might have Nika spelled now. I don't practice spelling in the double vowel system. I just read it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, and you can tell like that say like, gotta one, so gotash would be yeah, because it starts over. You'll start seeing like if you really wanted to go and counting, you'd see the pattern because it will change. Like it's gotta nika nish nika 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 until you get twenty, then it's queen nake. The queen nake walk, good the queen nake, and then when you get to thirty, it changes. Forty, it changes. Yeah, and then when you get, yeah, yeah, and you would see the pattern if we went through it. But we're just doing this for the simple, because we only need twelve hours, right? Yeah, I just want to make sure I spelt nika right. It might be N I H K A. <laughs> So we're going to learn how to, for time. For time? Yeah, so we can tell time. You know what time are you going to the store? You know, because these are so one o'clock, two o'clock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we don't, we didn't use ours. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's all right. We didn't use, and I'm pretty positive I spelled Nikara, but that's the way it sounds to me. Um, there are different, because we didn't use numbers, we used like morning. I mean, use the sun. So, like, when you say morning, because a lot of people in this area, when they learn mornings, how did they learn it? Good morning, they learned. Uh, well, it wapan, which, if you translate it into English, it means the same thing. But when you put it in, you know, like, if we were, like, if fluent speakers were talking, it would change. Mm -hmm. So, the way I learned was, um, um, I say it all the time, Walik Nayapalani. So uh, there's a difference between times and mornings. So like when I say that, people are like, what are you saying? Well, now if you say, well, it is really good, or is, literally means good, and wapan means morning, but it's a certain time in the morning. So like when we get into those things and get further along, we can, you'll start seeing those patterns and the change. So neither way is wrong. One is just more kind of English structure versus, you know, like if you were just speaking and generalized. So it's more. Yeah. Like early morning, like 8 a.m. is compared yeah. to. Yeah, Wapan is like right when that sun comes mm -hmm. up. And a lot of times when you hear people's with name, with names that have, okay, my daughter and my sister. So they have similar names. My mm -hmm. oldest daughter, her name is Witafanokwe. Mm -hmm. And my sister's name is Wampanokwe. Mm -hmm. So my daughter's is She Walks with Daylight Woman. Mm -hmm. And my sister's is Daylight Woman. And that walk is like right when that sun comes up. Okay. So the way you say morning is different time. So neither way is wrong. It's the same. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sorry, so you, you were saying that uh, uh, Lulit Wapan? Lulit Wapan would be right when the sun comes up. Yep, so it's, you're literally saying good morning, like right when that time comes up. Wapan is right when the sun like peaks. And then, uh, Great Night Pawnee? Walik Night Pawnee. Walik. So Walik. Nayapawani is like the, I don't know how you would say it, like the, because I'm not a linguist. I just learned. <laughs> so.
it's like the conjugated, more conjugated form of statement, where it's not like Nyapawani. Um, and this is what we're working on. Because this is the way that this book that I'm teaching you guys from, and the purpose of teaching you this way is to get your vocab down, to get you just talking. But the way that they talked was different. And the reason why they used this way is because that's how we taught so long, right? Um, because it makes sense to our English minds. So what we're working on is breaking down these words to get the meaning and the understanding of all of those different sounds and to really understand the language. If we can get that down, we no longer have to depend on this English way of learning because we can teach our kids the sounds and they will go with it after they get it in their brains. And it's, so the way you teach a kid is cough, cough, mom, mom, sleep, sleep, right? So if we keep, if we do that, they will start formulating those ideas and those thoughts and it will start clicking all on its own. So the way we started teaching is different than the way we taught normally. Because for years we taught this way and then we could only get so far. Because people weren't making those connections because they wanted to keep going back to English, right? So now we want to take that away. Why are you looking at me? Because <laughs> you love that English. <laughs> well, I was an English teacher. So I have to make sense for me because I, I, this is not my native tongue. Yeah. Can you teach an old bear? <laughs> no, I, I asked Nicole about the alphabet, and she said, we don't use an alphabet per se, it's all an oral. I know Nika you know. spelled wrong, though. So it, it's very hard for me to, to learn a foreign language unless it's like a uh, natural, you know, my... my Everybody that goes into learning another language wants to go back to their... Their um, native, their tongue that they grew up with, you know, their language that they grew up with, and they want to make those connections and relate. But it just doesn't that, work. Yeah, it doesn't work. And that's what makes language beautiful, is because it gives you an understanding of a whole different culture, a whole different way of seeing the world. And that's what's built in the language, and that's why it's so important to preserve any language, right? Because it sees and understands the world completely different than any other language that exists. So it's hard in the sense that you have to clear your mind, but it's beautiful in the sense that you have to clear your mind, right? Yeah. So, with that said, <laughs> it's, it's, and I'm still always learning, like, and that's, so like, when I think of me and where I am at learning, I'm like, man, I got a long way to go. But everybody else is like, you've gone a long way, right? But there's so much to learn. One of the things, because Gladys was my teacher and Bruce was his student and they did this language academy, right? Yes, I started learning years before, but it was just vocab. A little bit of here, you know, commands here and there, short sentences here and there when I was growing up. Things that stayed in the community, things that kept going in the community. But there was nobody who could speak speak in our community. Then when Glenn came, who was a food speaker, you know, we just ran with it. The thing that I wish I would have did more with him because this is what the fluent speakers hold that the learners don't hold, is they know what each sound of the language means through sight, through just seeing it. And so if we can get that down, our children, when they learn, they're gonna, they don't need somebody to instruct them because they understand it. Their minds work that way. So they can just, they can create language, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the goal. I'm just a stepping stone to get to the next generation so they can, and whatever we can keep alive. So that's what I'm doing with this database and the talking dictionary and the, these resource materials. I'm putting it all in one place. And if you ever, did anybody ever go online and Google, or go on YouTube and Google, or YouTube and look for monkey language? How much did you find? There's a, there's a good, uh, YouTube was, I think it was Glenn Jacobs, he goes through the prayers. Prayer, yeah, that's it. There's a couple things, if you know where to look, if you look up Kristen Jacobs, she's got a few things on there. Um, that's it. When I go in and have to work on documentation or different programs, I have to put in Ojibwe. Because that's the only thing that they, they understand. There's people, when people are looking for resources, they can't find any. So. 
I have boxes and boxes of resources from, you know, collecting from me, me and our language circles from all the communities we share, we exchange. You know, when we make something, we exchange it. When we learn something, we exchange it. When, but this is what I'm working on. I'm working on taking everything I have, and I have my, I'm working with somebody from each community, still looking for somebody from the Ramapo community, and we're taking all this documentation, putting it in one place so everybody has access to it. Some of the materials will be open to the public, and some of the materials will only be open to an people. Yeah. So um, it depends on how culturally sensitive it is. And that's how we're trying to conserve it, so that that next generation ain't like, where do I go? So that's, that's and it's gonna take years and years to do, but we're working on it. So I just wonder, is it okay to ask what, like, I think one example of a culturally sensitive thing that would be kind of um, protected? So this is something that maybe would be a good topic. Um, I asked Jill not to, to post some of the posts yet. Yeah, I want to review things. Mm -hmm. Because there's different things that I might say in class that stay in class. Um, and shouldn't go outside of class. Mm -hmm. So the reason being not because it's a secret, and even in with, in Indian country, people are like, oh, they're secretive over there. They're sec it's not like that. It's because when if you don't learn the whole reason, the whole understanding, you don't go through the whole process, because there is a process, then you could take the information that was given, the little bit of information that was given, and run with it and go do something, mm -hmm. and then, it, it can hurt people. It can give them a different perception and understanding of what it truly is. So it's to protect the knowledge. So when I, I've been working with language all my life and just so happens my mom uh, just asked me to give her, give me her story, my story. Um, Cause she's, I don't know if my mom's up to something but she's working on something. So I procrastinated and procrastinated and finally I was like, I'll write it down for her because she kept asking and asking. And so finally I was like, what do you need this for? And she said, she's taken, she's on the historical committee, so she was going on a trip. So I'm like, all right. So I write it out for her, send it to her. And then she's like, oh, this is beautiful. And then I'm like, I don't even know what I read. So I go back and proofread it and edit it because there's a lot of mistakes in there, edit it. And what I realized was that the process that I went through to get to where I am today, um, I couldn't be teaching with the back of my community and the back of the other communities and the back of the other teachers if I didn't go through that process. And there's a reason. So um, I don't only do language, I do cultural things as well. But I had to go through an entire year of just self-reflection. And in that self-reflection, I had to like pretty much face my own self, my own demons, and I had to work on me. The reason being is when you do that work, you have to do it in a good way. And you, you can't have biases, you can't have hatred. You have to not just be able to say the words, but be able to, your action has to be able to follow behind those words. Because everything that we do is with intention. So it takes a lot of work. If you know like who's our worst critic, Ourselves. ourselves, right? So if you're talking to yourself in that way, you're giving that energy out to other people, right? Mm -hmm. So it takes a long time to get into that that place. So that's what I mean about process. So if somebody's just going out there and teaching these things and giving it and puking it on people, what is that going to do to the people, right? If they don't have that in place, so you, that intention is really, really important. So. That's what I mean culturally sensitive. So it's not the knowledge. It's what you're, what's behind that knowledge. What you're, and, and the process of that knowledge. That's what I mean culturally sensitive. Isn't that one of the reasons why our people um, was more um, uh, storytelling rather than writing anything down? Because that way it, wasn't, it didn't get out to people that weren't part of it. Uh, so, like, a storyteller, you know, like when they took, like you would, they pass down different things, but it was something that it wasn't written down, like uh, so somebody to read it. It was like passed from from generation. You to know, the, this is a good thing to keep in mind. So the things that are written down in in history, mm -hmm. that you know, like maybe a missionary wrote down a story right. or something mm -hmm. or a ceremony that they saw, 
Our people actually literally told them wrong things and made jokes of it um, on purpose. Right, right. On purpose right. to keep it to keep it safe. Mm -hmm. You know, um, what I mean by uh, so oh the storyteller. So the storyteller is actually a position in a community. It's somebody who is actually literally trained because we didn't have reading and writing. Right. So oral history was, it, it was a responsibility. Like the way that I was taught is that I'm not allowed to talk. So like a lot of times I'll be like, I know a little bit, or I don't have enough teachings. Like my, my niece, she messaged me today and she messages me a lot because she's in college and she's working at her degree in First Nation Studies. And a lot of times I can give her an answer or I can direct her towards somebody who has an answer. And, it, and I do that on purpose because I don't want her to not, I don't want her to be cheated for one. So today she asked me about nails and how we take care of nails. And I do have a lot of those teachings, but I, that one thing, I understand how to take care of them, but I don't understand why. Like I understand the hair, but not the nails. And I said, I, my educated guess would be that it's very similar. You know, our hair holds memories, our hair holds our strengths. So you don't just leave those things lay around, right? So I would say it would be the same thing, but I told her, I'm not comfortable with that answer. And I can't tell you that I have that answer, but this is who you can ask. And, that, and that's being responsible, really being responsible. So when somebody learns a story, this is the way I was taught, and this is the way I was told that it should be. So from every teaching, every story that exists in our culture, mm -hmm. there's seven that come from that. So you have one teaching, there's seven that come from that. From them seven, there's seven more. And from them seven, there's seven more. So it's a lifelong learning process. Mm -hmm. A lifelong learning process. And it takes dedication and paying attention. And they said before you tell, retell a story or teach a story, you have to learn it seven times and seven different times in your life before you, you can say, I know that story. Because you're responsible for that story. And in seven different times in your life, you're gonna experience that story seven different ways, right? So to have that responsible, it's being responsible because you're passing on information to the next generation. So when people ask me stuff, I, I even tell them it might be a lie. Mm -hmm. because I don't remember the whole thing and I, I'm always really clear about that because I don't want anybody to take what I say and say this is the truth this is what it is right mm -hmm. and when I, there, I know that I've been taught multiple different ways I say the same thing you know it's just really being it's just being culturally responsible it's and it's oral history is extremely extremely important yeah. you know Like, like um, I was just reading um, uh, from the Seminole, and we had a school, we had a teacher at Ringwood. She only stayed one year. She was from the Navajo Nation. She was one of the best teachers we had. Every year, she would like for holidays, she would go home to like to her her uh, reservation and she would break this pinion nuts that we, you know, because we never experienced it here. And she would come back, but she would say things, and then she would, she said she would say to us, "Well, it's just." I can't tell you everything, but it's just part of a story, she said. Yeah. And I remember her saying that when it was like the fourth grade, I think. The third or fourth grade, I think we had her. Our stories, too, are like, so I've gone to many, many different teachings, right? And those teachings are set in, in sacred spaces mm -hmm. to honor those teachings, right? And I've got... I so I'll just give you an example. I took my kids and I have five babies and they were all a little bitty at the time, so you know how nervous I was, right? Because yeah. usually when I went to ceremonies, I'd pick a couple. <laughs> like, you two get to come with me today. <laughs> but this time I took them all and I was really, really nervous because they were all a little bitty. And I was like talking to them before we went in and I was like, grandmas and grandpas are there and you need to be respectful and we're going to listen, so you, you know. And I'm still nervous, so I separate them. I have two here two sitting by their grandma, two over here by their auntie, and we're sitting there. That one teaching, and it was this much of a story, took five hours. Wow. 
but it engaged my kids that much that I didn't hear a peep out of them. My little bitty kids sat for five hours. Yeah. So, and, and they were like just in awe, you know? And it was just that much of the story. And every time you go back, can you hear it from a storyteller? Mm -hmm. You're going to hear a little bit more, learn a little, bit, a little bit more. So one of the things we practice is talking circles, right? So in, the, in that talking circle, and this is general rule, just to be a reminder. And in our teachings, that's what they are, the reminders on how to walk on this earth. It was a reminder um, to be respectful. So whether they used a rock or a feather or one of their helpers, a tool to help them. It was, that was the reminder that, okay, they're speaking, I need to listen. And it, it's just as important to listen as it is to speak. Even, I think, more, more important to listen than it is to speak for the simple fact that when you're speaking, you're teaching, you're sharing, when you're listening, you're learning. And if you, what we just discussed, how much do we have to learn? You know, it's a lifelong process. They said that even the chiefs that exist today, none of them have that, all that knowledge anymore. Because the, the chiefs that were born into it and prepared, were prepared from birth. You know, and they don't, and it just a little bit more is lost every day. There's a lot of chiefs out there with extreme knowledge, but not like it was before. to my daughter-in-law and I see on, on their site that they have language classes daily mm -hmm. and they're you know then in the summertime they, it's really that's just it, it, when the kids have class then it's just amazing mm -hmm. so because yeah. they've lost a lot of it and they're trying to get their, their the youth like they said it's it's we're up there in the age but the kids are the ones you want to be able to give it to them so they'll be able to keep passing on I see that they have a lot of classes for them for the mobile language as a matter of fact, my son is um, Justin's doing it now, but he talks with his mother-in-law. His mother-in-law, she's what she said, 75, 76 years old. So she's, I mean, she speaks their language, but her daughter doesn't. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to like we're trying to speak their language. Yeah. That's the same thing, you know. I I was just one of the kids that picked it up when I was little, so my aunts kept working with me. Um, but the, like a, for me with dancing. Singing, um, language, culture, that's a, even though they're my own children, my children's journey is between them as great. Now. It was already, you know, decided between their spirits. Mm -hmm. I'm only here to support them, not them, and guide them, be there for them. I'm not to interfere with their journey and what, what their heart and spirit already know. So if one of my kids didn't want to dance, I didn't push them. Mm -hmm. One of my kids weren't, didn't want to learn the language, I didn't push them. But when they did, I thought I was there to right. give them everything I could. Right. I only had one of my kids who showed interest in the language. My other kid showed in interest in another part of her language, another part of who she is, not her mother's language. Um, and my other kid, they had answered me in English, but they didn't use it. But they knew what I was saying, right? Uh, my granddaughter, you know, she was like, that's how she responded, but I tried with her from when she was born. And that's a, like when my granddaughter was born, I did this with my grandson too. But when my granddaughter was, was born, I told my daughter when, and it was put right in her birthing plan. And my grandson, then my granddaughter, that will come will be the same way. That the minute she comes out, nobody's to speak, and I will speak the first words to her. And it was in the language. And from that day forward, it was like, give her as much as I could. And it, today, some of her words, are in the language before English. So that is a practice that we did, you know, after she was, well, it was a practice we did all the time anyway, but it's so much more important because they're exposed to English all the time. Right. But if the first words that they ever hear when they come to this earth is in our own language, that connects with their spirit. And like these kids here, I mean, they're soaking, I mean, she's soaking it right up. <laughs> <laughs> To be young again. <laughs> and he, well, he struggles with his with speech to be good. And he's, he, he's, he, he struggles with his speech, but I mean, he knows what they are because, like I said, and, for you weeks. know, there was 
times where I would go to the teachings and I would fall asleep. And I would sit there and I would try, because sometimes it was early, early in the morning, or sometimes it would go really late. And I would sit there and I'd feel guilty and I'd feel bad and I'd be trying to stay awake, trying my hardest. And finally a grandma came up to me, tapped me on the shoulder, and she said, go to sleep, your spirit's still with me. Because mm. yeah. if you think about it, you're tired. And all you're doing is thinking about, I need to stay awake, I need to stay awake. Right, so you're not, talking you're not, to anybody, you're not hearing it. I mean, I can't even go power. <laughs> I mean, it was a, it was like it, my mind was all over the place, and I just couldn't think. I couldn't think straight at all. <coughs> so I kept looking at the words yesterday that I said, you know what? I, and I wrote it down the way I thought it sounded to me, and then I obviously seeing it on there obviously spelled a different way. But I, I wrote it how it sounded to me, and then I wrote what it was supposed to mean on the other side. But it's like you said, if you're you're not. Can't, if you're not paying, it's not paying attention. Okay. It isn't there. You're not gonna. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, it's that time again.